Hi everybody, good evening. Thank you for, uh, thank you for coming uh, to the uh, fourth talk uh, in the Spaces of Contestation speaker series um, presented by Unit Pitt, the SFU Van City Office of Community Engagement and the SFU Institute for the Humanities. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Coast Salish territories. Spaces of Contestation is a project uh, realized through Unit Pitt Projects Curatorial Residency Program, and I would like to thank uh, Unit Pitt and Keith Higgins for uh, their support of this project and uh, for making it happen. So the project is a series of talks, performances, public actions, publications, and an exhibition that examines the collective walk, protest, or public demonstration as both a performance and a social formation. The core of the project is in four collaborations between artists and community organizations that initiate community engagement and democratic use of public space via the realization of site-specific participatory performances. Participating artists include Lord Marsden, Didier Morelli, Gabriel Mendel Solomon, and the Unlearning Weekenders Collective formed by Zoe Cray and Catherine Gros. Um, you can find programming details for all of the events uh, of the project on Unit Pitt's website, um, but uh, we are getting close to the beginning of the exhibition and the performance series, which uh, begin next Saturday, so March 22nd. Uh, Lauren Marsden's performance uh, is the first performance of the series, and it's going to happen between 1 and 3 p.m. Um, around the Vancouver Public Library main branch and the exhibition in the gallery space at uh, 236 East Pender uh, opens on that day as well. So I invite you to check that out and to look at the website for the whole series of performances that are happening uh, so as of next week and all through April. Um, so the speaker series, though, that uh, this event tonight is part of um, is organized in parallel to this project and aims to foster critical discussion around issues of urbanism, economy, community activism, and politically engaged artistic practice. Um, so I mentioned that it is co-presented by uh, Unit Pitt, the SFU Venn City Office of Community Engagement, and the uh, SFU Institute for the Humanities. And the project as a whole, uh, we should acknowledge, is supported through the BC Arts Council's Art Space Development arts-based community development program and by the Hamber Foundation. You can view uh, video documentation of the three other talks, Jeff Mann, Jamie Peck, and Urban Subjects on the Van City Office of Community Engagement's website and on Unit Pitt's website. And tonight's talk would also be uh, available online. So um, the upcoming speaker is uh, Kirsty Robertson and she will be speaking here on April 16. Without further ado, I'll introduce Stephen Collis and then pass it over to him. And uh, we'll have a, about a one hour long talk and um, then a question and answer period. So stick around afterwards. So Stephen Collis is a poet and professor of contemporary literature at Simon Fraser University. His many books of poetry include The Commons, published by Talon Books in 2008, On the Material, Talon Books in 2010, which was awarded the BC Book Prize of Poetry, to, and To the Barricades, Talon Books, 2013. He has also written two books of criticism and a novel, The Red Album, published by Book Thug in 2013. His collection of essays on the Occupy movement, Dispatches from the Occupation, published by Talon Books, 2012, is a philosophical med meditation on activist tactics, social movements, and change. In September 2013, Coach House Books published Decomp, a collaborative photo essay and long poem written with Jordan Scott. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, thank you, Am, uh, with the uh, Van City Office for Community Engagement. Thanks to, to Keith and Unit Pitt. Uh, and thanks, Marianne, especially um, for all, all the work you've done in organizing these talks. It's a real honor to, to speak in this series. And thank you as well for, for acknowledging the territories. Um, that's always really Im important, I think, uh, and, and really to do any kind of um, political work in this area. It's, it has to be the foundation, has to be where we, where we start uh, with indig indigenous solidarity because um, that is underlying everything. So really, I, I'm talking tonight about about resistance. Um, and uh, I'm going to work through some ideas about resistance by looking at a, a, a number of different kinds of spaces 
uh, spaces of contestation. I'll take that very literally and run with it. Um, I'll start with a more material space and move more in a conceptual direction, but I'll come back to a very material sense of space as well. And along the way, I'll, I'll intersperse these, these comments uh, with some poems from my own work. Yeah. And we'll see how long that takes. So I'm going to begin uh, with a poem, Metal Shield. Turn from the picture of a guy in Taksim Square receiving the full force of water cannon stream, dwarfed and hunkered down alone behind metal shield, his gas mask in place. The shield, some repurposed piece of the polis. City equals cops, the white trucks proclaim. And Joshua is asking for some shield creased down the center and folded back 30 degrees each side to solve water cannon via deflection, as long as it was turned to face the direction of the stream, like this guy. But I can't help imagining some meta shield, call it, if not lost class consciousness, then the f still amassing singularities of fucking hell, can't you see we are all up against this together and yes, alone, the city lives we live being liquidated and the countryside removed to reveal lakes of oil and money. So Polis is this, and we need a shield big enough to deflect the full force of capital crashing against us. Where the hell is that? But there's that guy still, singular and not willing to cave while we wonder what is to be done when it seems nothing can be done, riot dogs barking at the still glistening line of clear cops' shields, drifting spray of water cannon, sunshine, and smoke. What we need right now is not meta, but smack in the thick we need real shields in real streets, ripped open and so much I realize depends upon the people of Turkey, streaming back towards Taksim Square at this very moment forming large human shields we can all hunker down behind as we turn to face the direction of the stream, hoping our bark is nowhere near as bad as our bite. Okay, so that was written last spring when all that was, was really starting to happen. This is Canalos, the riot dog of Athens. Uh, there are a number of, of, of riot dogs, it seems, but there's one who's particularly the celebrity of, the, of this situation. So there are many stray street dogs living in Athens. Uh, Canalos, this lovely guy right here, uh, has a habit of showing up at protests, of uh, disliking the police and attacking them, and, and aligning itself very clearly with the, the protesters. So there are all sorts of Photographs you can find a line of Canalos. He's like even like there's a can of tear gas smoking and and I guess careening across the ground and there's Canalos chasing it trying to bite it and pick up the tear gas. So there are even stencils around Athens of the dog with a slogan under it in Greek that says I eat tear gas. <laughs> so he's he's quite a celebrity. I think he has actually passed away now. That this this particular dog, uh, but he had a good run for a while there. Commune, commune editions, a collective out of Oakland, California, suggests that the poetry and other writings they publish, work that is antagonistic to capital and the state, this is their description, plays a role similar to Canalos, accompanying the movement of the streets, providing support and strangeness, and perhaps on occasion biting the leg of a cop. I've begun to think of many of the shorter occasional poems I write, like the one I began with here tonight, Poems that usually occur in and around organizing and actions, or written in solidarity with events taking place elsewhere, as riot dogs. Commune editions invent the poetic riot, riot dog in part as a caution, a stop against the inflationary tendencies of the avant-garde. Poetry is a modest thing, they warn, and it is certainly not a replacement for concrete forms of action. I share this concern but I want to understand where this desire to set limits comes from and to return from these limits to look a little more closely at the work of work poetry and other forms of cultural resistance uh, in fact do in the various spaces they contest. 
Commune editions and other poet activists are, I think, reacting to the Adornian situation, is how I tend to view it anyhow, uh, via which poets and artists have been able to comfortably resist by form alone. This is Adorno from the Commitment essay and his rejoinder to Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and that, what Adorno sums up there, I think you can read elsewhere in the avant-garde, that sense um, that, that it's form alone that really matters and is political. The avant-garde comfort zone of bourgeois production through which one's politics can be framed in purely aesthetic terms. The idea that form is action. The weight of events, the very force of the state felt by many in recent years, not to mention the material excesses of capital, has pressed this on us. Art doesn't pick up a tear gas canister and throw it back at the cops. Poetry doesn't smash the windows of a bank. It's not an equivalent gesture. In correcting this idea about the avant-garde, in reminding us of the need to act and the urgency of the streets, this sort of argument can perhaps go too far in the direction of casting aside poetry and other cultural practices as having little, little or no social or political valence whatsoever. The baby with the bathwater. Because I do think there is a complex interaction of felt, imaginative, expressive, ideological, and intellectual modes of being and the being of the street and other contestatory spaces. One does not arrive at the barricade, for instance, without some impulsion. Even precarity, if that is the impetus to take to the streets, that, that there is no other choice, essentially. Even precarity is felt, is often imagined in particularly expressive, particular expressive ways as it is lived, and is sometimes intellectualized, theorized, and canalized into movement and resistance. One can neither cast poetry out of these processes nor rely upon something as flimsy as poetry to carry out the work of resistance on its own. When I speak here of poetry in shorthand, I speak of one example of a host of diverse, effective, intellectual, and generally cultural practices that can build our capacity for resistance and social transformation. Let's consider briefly that much maligned concept of inspiration. Commune editions mention it too, as an attribute of the riot dog. I have in mind inspiration as breath, as in-breathing, the expansion of lungs as adrenaline hits your bloodstream, the mind sharpens and races, and you head for the street, ready for the fray. Expanding the notion of this in-breathing body and mind to the body politic, we might think of inspiration as capacity building, something that social movements talk about all the time the expanding collective capacity of social movements. So while poetry may not make anything happen, as Auden famously complained, it can be part of the creation of the conditions in which something happens through inspiratory capacity building. I'm hovering over this issue before I move on because to contest space is to engage in resistance. And resistance is as much about building and maintaining the capacity to resist as, as it is about any specific act or gesture of resistance. Thus the importance of those inspiring social and cultural modes of being which add to this capacity. I'm taking this uh, argument from Howard Cagill's recent book on resistance, which was just published in December, I think. Resistance, Cagill argues, implies the tension of opposing forces and, quote, to defy or take a stand assumes a capacity to resist, which is the outcome of previous stands within previous scenarios of opposed forces." End quote. Kegel is working from Karl von, von Clausewitz's classic On War, which he reads as a manual of resistance in which resistors attempt primarily to build and maintain their capacity to resist, while aggressors attempt to erode resistors' capacity to resist. All this quote, within a complex and dynamic spatio-temporal field that manifests itself in postures of domination and defiance, end quote. Kegel also invo invokes uh, Georg Lukács' history and class consciousness to note that in the context of an historical tendency toward the reification of life and consciousness, the theory of resistance as capacity building is crucial to any attempt to defy that tendency. The building of the capacity to, to resist, and I'm quoting Kegel here, 
looks less to the possibility of changing consciousness than to identifying the sites, places, or moments where resistance to reification can emerge. These are moments of invention that explode in a culture dedicated to calculation, whether political invention in the workers' councils or Soviets, or by leaps of artistic imagination beyond reification. I find in this an invitation to consider the spaces of contestation in which resistance is built and maintained, in part via works of art and philosophy, this is Kegel again, works of art and philosophy which point to potential sites of resistance to reified culture and consciousness. The cultural work of which often takes the form of instancing a variously articulated resistant subjectivity. What I'm suggesting is that as, is that as much as poetry is a riot dog, it can also function as, and please excuse the canine pun, a research lab for capacity building and the formation of resistant subjectivities. In both cases, we might experience capacity building, but I think the riot dog does so reactively, while the research lab opens a more speculative space in which we might think our way towards other possibilities. In what follows, I'll bring Kegel along as a guide to reading a series of contested spaces and reading poems, mostly of the more speculative variety that also inhabit those spaces via their resistant research. I am not primarily attempting to gloss my own poems here. I am simply placing them beside some thoughts about these contestatory spaces, which they are in solidarity and conversation with. This is a, a Zach Embry photograph uh, from uh, a march in, I think, January 2013 that uh, Rising Tide here in Vancouver organized, along with a bu bunch of other groups, too, uh, to welcome and greet the uh, Enbridge hearings when they arrived in Vancouver. It was a beautiful night with Christmas lights still up and drizzling rain and probably about a 1,000 people. <clears throat> so, one, my first example, the street. I'm going to pause briefly here largely because this is the most obvious and familiar contestatory space. And yet this very obviousness, what should we do? Take to the streets, is itself a problem. It's actually pretty easy to organize a street march. I think there's people that are going to disagree maybe <laughs> deep in the midst of it. <laughs> uh, but reasonably easy to stop traffic with a handful of bodies. And the cops are well experienced here and know what to expect. I don't know how many times I've taken to the streets only to march dutifully along behind the flashing lights of a cop's motorcycle as he leads me, so it seems, like a good dog around the corner of this and that. A street march in Vancouver is a very long away, way from the tear gas and rock-filled skies over riots in Mediterranean Europe, South America, or Southeast Asia. And by comparison, it hardly looks like resistance. I should be add Quebec to that list, to Montreal from 2012. Uh, that was resistance. And yet, I want to advocate for street marching as capacity building. Street marching is doing the same sort of inspiratory work as poetry and other cultural practices do. The street march, as we experience it in Vancouver, isn't about to win, let alone engage in, a direct struggle with the state and capital. But in its very frequency and its often ecstatic nature. This was a very ecstatic march. As so often an experience of empowerment, social permission, and at least softly resistant subjectivity, marches build capacity for the long haul. They also potentially tax the state's capacity to contain and restrain them. And I think this is you know, what the, the Montreal student uh, example, uh, especially the casseroles that happen uh, later on, really demonstrated. Is that if you have people marching every night in every single neighborhood of town, it's awfully expensive and awfully hard for the police to deal with that. The more we are in the streets, the more the resources of policing are called upon, the more frustrated the state becomes by this incessant exercising of pesky democratic rights. Ultimately, here where we march in a place invaders called Vancouver, here on Coast Salish territories, we will need to do a lot more than simply march through these streets. As often as marching inspires me and fills my lungs with capacity to yell and chant and sing, it leaves me fearful, 
unsettled, unsatisfied, and it's being too easy, being not enough, here, now, on this precipice. There's something fearful in, in its not being enough, in its being too easy, as though the cops can and will close in any minute now, when they finally decide we've had our fun, when our play protest time is over, because there's an unanswered question. Will we really forcefully resist when it comes to that? Because I think it will come to that. I'm going to read a poem about marching in the street. <clears throat> this is called Dear Common Vancouver. It begins with an epigraph by an American poet, George Oppen. I choose to believe in the natural consciousness. I see what the deer see. Dear Common, in Vancouver, we slip amongst money, coast mists and lumber memories, wondering if rain falls equally upon the heads of the rich and poor, no noblesse for this oblige as companies mine death to deliver largesse. But city of sight lines and seawalls, where can I lay my natural consciousness here, my animal spirits unleashed into the waters of the streams corralled in culverts beneath, beneath non-existent paving stones? Rhetoric is a glass font, a chromed entrance to banks and soaring offices. My language is simple and inert. I might turn to the sentence as a prison or an escape. Dire predictions stop nothing. The arteries fill tunnels and bridges with unbarricaded traffic. A flash mob is one thing. The way the mountains shoulder their load of snows is another. No Atlas, no Olympus. But to see what the deer see is a revolution of another kind. Dear apparatus for accumulation, you platform for capital we call home. There are demonstrations, and we demonstrate. Police wear yellow reflective vests, and some of us have reflective vests too, directing traffic to the manifestation of other ends. No monetary reasons in mind. Like I could love another, seems almost ontological. The lift of their limbs, voice raised, know this, know that, in the sound we make individually, though somehow the same spatially and temporally united, you know whose streets are streets. Vancouver is not a march or an occupation, but it seems so in its fixity, where we'd unleash all this movement, course together, but work on smoothing the edges, where one breaks off and another begins. You see, we spilt this city over indigenous land, mountain spirits down to the midden-heaped beaches, something primitive, say, commerce or colonization, the blunt heads of culture driving stakes until indignant and damn, I kick my juice if rhyme was a drum, I'd sell it by the gram. Vancouver, you light between mountains and a sea where derricks crane and condos never cease to amaze. Dear Common, a city is no essence, but this conversation, this address is something close, though it's tricky to see clearly when even the cops ride bikes and green things become a market of seeming values so boxed. Voices say, what are you protesting against? The lap of luxury and medicinally planned peace, or is it just your profession to be in the streets, all these signs and bullhorns in your basement just waiting for a cause, some predictable riot against government's disdain? Dear effects of tireless treason, the social only shuffles if you move your feet. We've learned this in a place invaders called Vancouver. Even if we are only a few, and even if it rains on the day of the demo, Dear Common, what we love about this place is outside the accumulation of real estates or pile-up of colonial collisions on an unmarked historical highway bleeding resources into chemical seas. You see, as the lights dimmed over the downtown east side and tents went up in a vacant lot where developers dreamed of condos sleek in their reflective skins, who could tell just how far we were from a 19th century Paris we built and unwittingly rebuilt in our radical minds. 
I'll tell you, next time we stream into the city, celebratory and decked in red, it will be for no hockey game, no civic or national spectacle, but the ghosts of solidarity's past grabbing hold of the material city, stone by shaking stone, to heave it into the sea or onto a raven's sleek back. If this weren't a poem, I would want to talk of protests, of marches in these streets, the force of voices and flags, a group singing loudly, a group carrying what looks like a silk dragon, a group with masks and a makeshift battering ram. I would want to say Paris, say revolution, say Paris and Vancouver touch known and unknown, but it is not true, and we go on ignorant of the we we have been becoming. So long, they say, so long to all that anger and dissent, so long we are government, and you have nothing to do with us, but we have everything to do with you. So long, Paris. Hello, Vancouver. Hold on, hold on, I say. I ask, have we arrived yet? Have we begun or even returned from having begun once before? Hold on, hold on, Brigitte de Pape on the Senate floor with your sign, Stop Harper, Stop Louis Napoleon. We are coming, or we have been, or we are on our way back from a Paris in our barricaded hearts. Vancouver, I've seen you on the day of a protest stream along streets to work or between appointments or yoga or shopping in your various hotnesses, ignoring us and the noise we make, the color of our banners and the precise words we've printed there or which we chant the normal of banks and Starbucks and oblivious boutiques to the rain and the gulls or pigeons hunched above trolley wires. And I was frightened by the gray stone of your milled eyes the crystal of camera lenses, sound of a band or game at the stadium, and I ran with these strangled others towards an endless line of cops or some large vacant parking lot, late, with nothing and no one there, just a lone and thin bear eating garbage or an orca gasping on the pavement having burst from the ground. Two. The commons. My second sight is a little subtler in nature, as it is a spatiality that has virtually been eliminated through waves of reification, the full extension of the regime of private pop property and real subsumption. I'm speaking about the commons, the dependence upon common lands for human subsistence and social reproduction throughout history, as well as the fact that, historically, the majority of the Earth's surface was, in fact, if not in name, a commons, a shared source of livelihood, free of regimes of private property. Capitalism is predicated upon the enclosure and expropriation of the commons, whether in the form of the English open field system or in its colonial extension into pre-contact First Nations territories of hunting and gathering, as Marx made clear in his primitive accumulation chapters. Now in this late North American capitalist phase, virtually all land is colonized and privatized with public lands simply being leased by proprietary states to private industrial and extractive corporations. My point here is fairly straightforward. The elimination of the commons, not to mention the continued identification and enclosure of new commons in terms of water, air, DNA, data, et cetera, et cetera. The constant incursion deeper and deeper into the body by proprietary law not only eliminates the material possibility of reproduction outside of capitalist networks, it damages, if not completely eliminates, the possibility of, for thinking otherwise and for experiencing a common subjectivity, a shared idea, uh, sorry, a shared identity as commoners whose lives are completely dependent upon the practice of our commoning together. Thus, I see the return to the concept of the commons not only in the light of alternatives to capitalism, however ghostly or hypothetical, but also, and perhaps at this point more significantly, as the source of potentially resistant subjectivities, diametrically opposed to those being produced and positioned by neoliberal capitalism as isolated, alienated, competitive consumer subjects, crystallized, crystallized by systemic reification. Where we can find a wisp or remnant of the commons, we can find a space of, for contestation 
a ground for resistance, a place to stand in other relations with each other, a location to challenge the reductive definition of life under neoliberalism. I find such a fragment of the commons, a ghost or remainder, in the urban and suburban wild blackberry patch of the Pacific Northwest. Blackberries grow in inverse, relations to private prop- inverse relation to private property. They flourish in vacant lots, in urban and suburban wastes where property development was abandoned, foregone, or unrealized, along fencing and ditches in ambiguous and unused junk space between developed properties or along roadside easements. They occupy the wilder parts of our parks and they thrive at the edges of cities around dump sites, water slides, go-kart tracks, railroad, railway lines, stockyards. Everywhere capitalist production produces its excess waste spaces, there is food to be foraged. This is a, um, an image of a, a site. Uh, this is from Pryor Street looking sort of back toward Maine over there in the distance in downtown. Um, just to your left will be the, the train station. Uh, it doesn't look like that now. This is from about 2006 or seven. It now looks closer to this. At least that's last year I took that picture. It's been uh, cleared off, uh, leveled, gravel. At one end of it, they're building like a, a, a soccer field. I don't know what the rest of it's going to be yet. I think it's still just a gravel lot. But back in 2000 and six, seven, when I first became curious about it as a space near downtown, it was completely overgrown, mostly with blackberry brambles. Uh, I led a couple of uh, walking tours through that uh, space at that time, talking about uh, blackberries and commoning and urban foraging, and uh, reading a poem that I'm just going to read here in a, in a few minutes. Um, and there were people living in there. There were some sort of shelters built in amongst the brambles. So people were literally living inside blackberries. And, you know, I purposely went in, like, August and late summer when there was lots to eat. Okay. In August, we go berrying. We share the berry patch, climb together through the brambles along little burrowed passageways. Everywhere we find and know these junk spaces and urban and suburban wastes, we go picking and make our jams and pies and preserves to share with family and friends. We, largely urban consumers extraordinaire, still cling to this, this, one of the few acts of social reproduction not directly touched by capitalist relations, idealistically. (laughs) This rare practice of urban and suburban foraging this play at being commoners, dependent upon what can be found in the open. In the 19th century, Henry David Thoreau practiced a highly politicized form of burying, and he wrote about it extensively. It always comes up in his writing. Repeatedly, he identifies the wild berry patch as, A, a space where the state was absent. He literally says that. He says, I'm in the berry patch, and the state is nowhere to be seen right now. And B, as a space notable for the absence of market relations. No berry could be purchased, he held, because a purchasable berry was no berry at all. Berries came from the social practice and relations of burying, a a shared activity, not purchasing. So Thoreau tells a story in several different places where he was arrested for not paying his poll tax because it was uh, 1848 or so, and uh, the U.S. was at war with Mexico and grabbing like California and Texas. And he said he, he couldn't stand the idea that his tax dollar would purchase a bullet that would then enter some Mexican's body, is how he, how he said it. Um, so he refused to pay his taxes. He was put, arrested and put in jail for one day at some point for this. And the way he describes it is clearly very you know, constructive. But he says, uh, on exiting the, um, the jail... He immediately ran into a a party of huckleberry pickers, he says. And and within moments, he says, we were miles away from town, where the state was nowhere to be seen in the midst of an endless berry patch. Okay, so I'm going to read a poem called uh, Blackberries, um, written in this time period. Largely depended upon um, picking the juicy words out of Thoreau's writing, is how this poem was more or less composed. Thrust out backward bramble common. No visible fairyland, utopian, terse. 
My companion and I along blue wall, sudden as children, throwing the baby in red dress, frozen the quilted thrush, no other interest, save pecuniary, voluntary huckleberry party effect, the hedgerow, the light dissolving onto mercury flash paper prints. The owl, the sod, the soft gravelly bank's elastic nature confounds vagrant meandering river wrecks, strew bottoms, rivulet, shrubs, nuthatch, thither all birds in woods, spring nights and chickadee lisps, especially for aldermen and epicures. Do not feed the imagination as study out of doors, let alone your garden cease. I am astonished, quenching click, focused on bramble berry dell, over against self window us, a vision compelling in part, scattering a legion about one, my companion whispers between berries, the glory of architecture grows. Many an unnoticed wild berry, vespertinal habits, the walking of, which the springs of life. Growing imaginary alternatives to chain link, marginalia of suburban texts, rubus, remains, august, edges, improvements, converts. Leaves gentrified junk swagged with fruit taking to the fences. Points unjoined, canes lines spreading. Indefinitely spreading lines curving fruit. Centers circumference Euclid arcs radius. All right angles are incongruent. Infinitely many intersecting commons coil. To find wind sudden together along roadside untended curving canes. Walk fields, wood scent selves, those which you have fetched, yourself carry us thither baskets, shake off village, return senses, prospect harmony, radius never quite, familiar of all large trees. People would begin mere objects to the state, burning fences. A rare red low being where it grows prickles sparingly. This sound information in five sides of canes and leaves, fifth berry of the year, trundled amongst trees to offer form to swallows' songs or robins trying to recognize the shape of a nest amidst tangle of twigs and bramble. Found in Emerson, antennae, and stamina fuller, dialed downcast, rejected delight, and interjected this else solitary and clear perception was no apples theft from others' orchard, each fruit wild and independent of any other, though many taken together make a better tart or with cream as his almost constant companion. to monopolize the little gothic window. Then did I use with eyes upturned the clouds to wander in rich drapery that I might peep a truant hawk or write a brief obituary as to what of the beautiful it had lived election amongst the plants feeding all kinds of pensioners. Everything miracle spore sated geometry found equinox, thrusting words having no connection into all parts of every sentence, bootjack, for instance, taking liberty, nothing and no place ventured, gained, to wit the berries' abundance. How could any contain scarcity? This many hands picking sense to gather scrutiny, shared provenance. Situate wandering lines in cool atmosphere, frothed linen, sweet attire, the pleasure of gathering together, the wreaths of black fruit, cottonwood smell ripe hawk's truancy. To all crows clatter we see so much only as we already possess jointly together a pronoun, a basket bushel, collected selves between no others. I hear of service berries, Pokeweed, juniper, vines, dross, the creaking of the earth's axle where beauty is in mosses along dry leaves or lifting the leaves the meadow mouse has slept in, the mutter of aperture saying, we only to themselves alone another memory of strained light. Stood clasped in brother's scarlatina, consolation of visiting daguerreotypist dawn, Burnt chemical pyre, watchful of nurses and friends, goodbyes, nimble, the nuthatch unlocked his health on fences forgotten between properties, 
The very roadside a fruit garden all culture aims to secure, though I've heard of pickers ordered out of fields. October-tinged poetry confounding change, leaves with withered ones ensued, island no concord runs a blur, look ma, no hands, triumph, so do leaves, the pellicle earth show of many fruits, which we ignore softening already, in shade till near end of August, thick enough to pick at some idler's folly. I understand nothing of illness, what grows out against our other springings, this spent thistle sending its spores, adoring, leaving as only a short excursion? Look, this is a print of the night sky unfolding. Look, these are my loved ones uttering chaos. I only see the beginning of bereavement. Earliest reddening woodbine, the lake of radical leaves, hickory, beautiful fleck turn over its leaves, and through oaks and aspens, spotted leaves, gloaming break of purple grasses, red maple elm, fallen sugar, scarlet patches glow, I begin to see children, the first ripe blackberries thereabouts, scarcely rising above the ground. Built subtle shack on common, turned back clock solitary, nary chipmunk dug borrowed mowed buried, thrift silent merchant spent days, mellowing this captioned self, banks mud warmed winged life those large and late low, hort, wortel spur snare buck. Prune, run over common dense clusters, clammy acid, taste countless variety. True flavor never purchased, obtained. Lost with the mere bloom, become mere provender. Thus finished errand, miles off midst endless berries, nowhere states seen history prisons, amid sweet fern and sumac, or growing more rankly, in low ground by rich roadsides, what no one owns, shared, thus are blackberries, remnant commons. <clears throat> I think I need more lung capacity sometimes in reading. Punctuation, punctuationless poetry is part of the issue. <clears throat> I think we've moved here in that example from reactive riot dog to the thinking space of an inventive research lab, a move we can see in poetry and imagine in our spaces of contestation. Cagill writes, one way in which the preservation and enhancement of the capacity to resist has been thought and practiced is through the invention of resistant subjectivity. Such a resistant subjectivity, I argue, is necessarily collective, common, in one sense, simply because in the context of neoliberal individualism, collective common subjectivities are by definition resistant subjectivities, outlawed and outcast, calling for what has been forbidden, our mutuality and autonomous interdependence, our commoning and our shared status as commoners. But there is a shift here from necessity to invention, from resistance as a bulwark against incursion, to resistance as a foundation for new social potentialities. This is Cagill again. The moment of, re of reactive resistance is volatile and vulnerable and needs in some way to metamorphose into an affirmative inventive resistance that does not just react to an intolerable predicament but transforms itself and its condition through the work of resistance, the actuality of its capacity this or the actualizing of its capacity to resist. This metamorphosis has sometimes been framed as a matter of consciousness, so raising people's consciousness, sometimes as occurring through the consecration of violence, but also, says Kegel, through the invention of new forms of solidarity and subjectivity. We can only forge such solidarities and collective subjectivities through living them and speaking them naming them and calling them forth. The call, rather than say the manifesto, being the key genre of the future as a, a space of resistance. Am I missing something? I think I probably should have, no. I thought I'm out of step with my slides. 
the call rather than, say, the manifesto being the key genre of the future as a space of contestation. I'm going to get to the future in a minute. A genre, in Kegel's words, that is a testimony to the capacity to resist in the course of actualizing itself. We've done that guy. I don't have time to go into this in depth here, but I think the halting exploration of a common subjectivity, a subject that can tentatively yet meaningful, meaningfully say, we, is everywhere in the background and sometimes in the foreground of the experience of contestatory spaces and the poetry that explores such spaces. And you'll see that I, I do tend to lean on the first person plural a lot in my own poetry, perhaps problematically. <laughs> I have found the most significant and provocative exploration of such a we in the Zapatista's many communiques, which consistently posit and call for a common subject that is at once inclusive and very aware of difference and particularity. A we that is both indigenous and simultaneously a call to reclaim the common from the individual bit clamped in neoliberalism's privatizing teeth. This we is a verb a performance of together, together, which acknowledges both commonalities and differences. We are not amorphous, but cut across by many fissures of difference. We are not Borg. We are not the 99%. We are simply we who are variously imperiled, standing now in solidarity to resist. The future. I'm not sure if he's being moved toward the future or he's being stored for, for later use. <laughs> we will function as a we, as a collective resistant subject in the future or else we will not function at all. It may be that simple. The future is obviously difficult to conceive of as a contestable space. We can't locate the future. And yet the history of left, progressive, and revolutionary struggles is nothing if not a struggle over what the future will be, over who shall inherit the earth and on what terms. Resistance itself, as Cagill is at, plain, at pains to make clear, is the building and maintaining of the capacity to resist now and into the future of our struggles. This, the idea of, of locked-in climate change, for instance, the fact that there is enough carbon currently identified in the ground and banked on, that is, it's essentially already been, that money's been spent. You know, banks look, you, companies say, we think there's X million, billion dollars of oil here, and banks monetize that instantly and are trading and selling that, that oil that's not even been taken out of the ground yet. So there's enough lo uh, uh, um, carbon already banked on to cook the entire planet well and good. If removed and burned at current rates, uh, this will render the future very much uh, a space of contestation because we must, of necessity, resist the processing and burning of this carbon. In doing so, we lay the ground for a different future uh, than the one currently being burnt, burnt before it's even born. We may, in fact, already be dead. But if we are, if we conceive of our common subjectivity in these terms, we are those who are fucked, those who have already written our death certificates. This may actually and ironically build our capacity to resist even further. Let me tease this dark bit of hope out a little. The resistant subjectivity of the Zapatistas, Kegel writes, responds to the voices of the dead. The Zapatistas, in fact, consider themselves as already amongst the ranks of the, of the resistant dead, and engage in the construction of a resistant subjectivity on the basis of a retroactive war of resistance. That was Kegel. What I have elsewhere called a practice of atemporal solidarity. Our capacity to resist is fed by our awareness of past examples of resistance. So we stand on the shoulders of, of giants, as it were. But we also owe something to the dead Whose, re, whose past resistance supports and inspires ours to carry on their resistance because we are the future. Those who have lived and struggled before us longed for. I think it's important to sort of play these games with time like that. So, you know, we are the future the past was waiting for and hoping it's going to be really great in the year 2014, isn't it? 
we've got a certain responsibility to, to think and act in the name of the dead. Just as we owe something to the future, to the unborn, to gift them a capacity to resist and in fact a world that it is still possible to struggle for. The resistant is already dead and futurity depended upon this because the resistant subject feels it has nothing left to lose. Perhaps because for all intents and purposes they are indeed already dead to global capitalism. This is uh, me glossing Kegel a bit but also directly glossing a lot of the Zapatista's own writings. Uh, which, which talks in these terms, essentially. So that for many people in the world, they're already dead to global capitalism, no longer needed, redundant, permanently unemployable. The resistant is also already dead because they come to imagine their actions retrospectively from the perspective of the future. How will my actions be judged, we ask ourselves? Will my resistance have been enough so I'm trying to suggest you we're, we're constantly in a strange relationship between past and future, where either we are the future of the past, or we are also looking ahead and going, when we are the past, how will that look from the future? Will we have done the right thing? Will we have lived up to this responsibility we have? We are seeing this more and more in climate justice. How will our actions, and lack of actions especially, be judged when the oceans have risen, the continents dried to deserts, the fish gone from the seas, most other species become extinct too. <clears throat> Here we are, the dead of all times, dying once again, but now in order to live. This is from the second communique to come out of the Lacondon jungle, just days after the Ap Zapatista uprising in January 1994. Kegel offers a number of his own explanations of the already dead subject or haunted subjectivity, he also calls it. The resistant subject struggles not for itself, but for others, for the future, for the commons. In this, they are also already dead. It's not their life that can be saved, but the lives of others yet to be born, the lives of, lives of others elsewhere on the earth, and the lives of the dead whose struggles can yet be realized, whose resistance can be maintained and continued into the future of our struggles. Quote, the resistant subject is not free to choose a life of, resi of resistance, but is already dead and so must resist. By affirming death, the resistant is no longer hostage to the useless death in life of capitalist social relations and assumes the dignity of a resistant life without fear of death. The resistant is no one and everyone, living but already dead, dead, but still living, end quote. Here's a little futurity. A song from the still struggling dead, a poem that comes to be inhabited by the voices of the Zapatistas and their most recent communique from December 2012, a resurgence, resurgence of resistance amidst talk of the Mayan apocalypse. So you know, people know this, but on December 21st, the supposed date of the Mayan Apocalypse. The Zapatistas uh, chose that date to, to have a massive march all through their, their territories in Chiapas. Um, tens of thousands of people all wearing those black um, ski masks. <clears throat> this is called Come the Revolution. This is cheesy. I didn't make this. I found it online already with that, those words over that famous image. I went, oh, well. Okay. <laughs> Come the revolution for Larissa Lai. Come the revolution. We will the revolution. We will return to the revolution. Return to the sensuous body of language. Come the revolution. We will return to the sensuous body and sound will propel us through the barricades of others, the revolution, through the barricades of otherness and come as mere sparks will spark us. Come the revolution anew and we will the revolution come anew and irony will no longer bind us. The sensuous body of language lift us, fringe to feather to fold us. The sensuous body of our methods single to 
togetherness and come the revolution, we will have time, the revolutionary time, to live the silent lives of animals, the revolution. Animals we have lost, that is, animals we have killed, the extinctions, corrupt economies, come the revolution, throwing off, throwing off sparks and new economies and throwing sound will propel us through the sensuous body, the revolution, the animal walls we are as producers and consumers as time and sound and the sensuous body of language will come the revolution when banks will have shaken, banks shaken to shivers, shivers come the revolution, all fossils fuel for their own revolution, we will come and walking as sound through sensuous bodies foreign, we will walk through, a, through an endless park, sensuous a park, we will walk from each of our abilities to each of our needs through sound, the revolution comes sensuous, come stroll, come the revolution, we will roll through birdsong and singular birches, come the transformations of home and together the revolution, this ecos will echo the sensuous body I speak of, together the revolution through this other's effulgence, so others come the revolution, we will echo new limbs, we will wrap self-governance in limits, wrap the sensuous body of human tongue in animal revolution, self-governance in bios and animal wrap, sound all live to be level to small habitations and habits to be level, animal and sound and sensuous body, small hearths of animal zone, all of us, all animals come the revolution, we will come to be animal, to be sound, sing the revolution, we will sing the swords out of song, sing swords into song, songs through fields, through bees, through these fields, sing chemicals out of oceans, sing economies, capacities, even sing balance, sing home, sustainable, sing sustainable, come sound, sensuous bodies, sustainable, sing songs of the absence of oil and death in the oceans, unsustainable, of tanks and guns and airstrikes, unsustainable, of endless colonial occupations, unsustainable, Profit motive and equity investments, unsustainable. Sing come the revolution. Sing a jubilee for all the revolution. Sing come hammer, come storm. The revolution will come and we will as animals, as sensuous bodies, begin to be born. Come the revolution. I will lift the voice of everyone. And in the poem, everyone will be listening and I will say, we are free or a force and we will be saying this and we will be free and we will be a force and I will say we are broken but whole and equally differently so and we will all be broken but whole and equally differently so and I will say I am with you and we are rising and I will say this in the form of a poem and we will be saying this and we will be together and we will be rising in the tireless forms of our poems. Come the revolution Culture flourishes best not in isolation, but enriched by the simple connection of our belonging to the belonging to the land, so that everywhere we are the animals, that know too well we are the animals, that must find our limits and love them. And we will govern ourselves within them, seeking agreement before confrontation, without government, a political class, or the media that accompanies them. Come the revolution, shit will no longer be fucked up and bullshit. And that which is loving in our hands will touch that which is loving in each and every other's hands. And while reading this poem still won't be the same as storming a bank or a parliament, you may yet be reading this poem to a group of people with whom you will presently be storming a bank or a parliament. The temporal extension of resistance via haunted subjectivity is mass matched by the spatial extension of resistance that the Zapatistas more or less pioneered. Resistance has a local material specificity, the Lacandon jungle in this example, but it reaches out to and in fact calls into being a common global resistance subjectivity. Perhaps it is not surprising that it is indigenous peoples and voices enduring the living death of colonization that extend this call for a common resistant subjectivity, a we who endure despite it all. Certainly it doesn't surprise me that it is this voice still filled with ancestors and prophecy that so inspires us to be a we who resist, breathing life into our resistant capacity so that we might all engage in the process of decolonization. But there is also an obvious material, material reason for this leap from local indigeneity to global resistance subjectivity that underwrites the Zapatistas' extension of their resistance outwards from the jungle onto the World Wide Web. And it's always kind of curious to remember, this was 1994, this is in the very early days of the internet, that, that they immediately made, saw that as, the, as a tactic and strategy to pursue. 
Note how quickly um, the locality of struggle now becomes global. How short a walk it is in terms of, of uh, affect, iconography, semiotics, practice, tactics, etc., from Tahrir Square to the Puerto del Sol to Zuccotti Park to Taksim Square and onward. It was a marvelous moment back in June of last year when uh, just a week or so into the Taksim Square, Gezi Park uprising in Istanbul, people started rioting in Brazil. And, and like instantly, people in Turkey were carrying Brazilian flags around. And then instantly the Brazilians started carrying Turkish flags around. And this is a kind of a pretty unique moment where there's that instantaneous uh, globalization of struggle that way. And, and I think a, a kind of common subjectivity being acknowledged or at least called into being in some way. This more material reason the local indigenous becomes the global struggle is the blunt fact that resource extraction the fuel that fires the global economy, pushes again and again in repeated waves of primitive accumulation and colonization into those marginal refuges indigenous peoples have been left or cordoned off in. And so indigenous resistance to this global economic system necessarily globalizes this resistance. As Kegel writes, quote, with the enormous demand of newly industrializing economies, he's thinking a little bit about how this is being debated in Latin America right now. I'd also add, though, that, that we can, it's not just newly industrializing economies, but it's those energy and technologically dependent and desperate economies of which we are one. Uh, this desperation for raw materials, um, any resistance, Resistance to attempts to extract these from indigenous lands and their peoples gives local resistance a global significance, end quote. So how do we contest this space? Because this space of extraction, to return to this final and material example, and I'm almost done here, is also this space. And this space and this space, and ultimately this space. I had one idea, inspired by the historical practice through which commoners would conduct a yearly perambulation of the bounds, as it was often called, of their common lands, collectively reaffirming its borders, so the, a local community would simply walk the limits of its common lands and everyone would sort of re agree again and reaffirm, yes, this is common and you shouldn't be privatized and taking from that land. And also noting like, hey, who cut down all these trees here? Or you're overusing it, right? But monitoring their own local uh, common land upon which they're dependent for subsistence. So with that idea in mind, I had thought of perambulating the space of extraction to conceptually reclaim land from the jaws of expropriation. There are some marvelous texts produced by, uh, from historical perambulations. So there are certain common lands that the state itself in England, for example, is quite interested in. Um, and, and it would actually send someone to document the perambulation. And you get these texts that are like 6, 10, 12 pages long. There's no punctuation. Well, there's commas, but there's no period. It's like one long sentence. It's all prepositional. So it sort of goes. Um, uh, so these, these consist of punctuation and grammar-free runs of prepositional phrases by this marker, past this marker, through this marker, over this marker, et cetera, et cetera, until the circle is complete, so that a wonderfully resistant literary text could be composed. But here is a danger, a problematic I will close with. The research lab, the poem is project which the writer articulates through grant applications and writerly talks about their practice and cites specific work in its documentation, is this yet another extension of the colonizing mind into spaces of contestation to make a project out of what is first and foremost a lived and embodied struggle of resistance? Do these sites of extraction need poetry? Maybe a little barking by some spontaneous riot dogs would be good. Something to spit out reactively before getting down to the dirty work of resistance. But the reality is I apologize for how small that image is. I just couldn't make it big. Um, the reality is the contestation of these spaces, so crucial to there being a future at all, the resistance of which is the ground upon which our common subjectivity will either be lost or forged anew, 
This contestation is already underway, beginning with the indigenous land defenders standing in, their, in the very localized paths of these projects and extending out along the global extractive network to all the allies and activists and communities who collectively resist the production and reproduction of the largest death machine ever built. The space is vast, global, diverse, and networked. We must resist it wherever we meet it, in whatever local manifestation it reveals. The sites of extraction, the pathway of pipelines, the ports where the oil, gas, and coal are loaded onto ships, the ports through which the carbon-fueled goods arriving by container arrive by container, the transportation lines and the retail outlets where they are sold. To do this, we will need a considerable capacity to resist. And we will need to connect our specific resistances to a common project for the future, to our common creatureliness on this ailing planet. And we will need to work as those who are already dead, deathlessly, dying again, in order one day to finally live. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That was great. Um, so we'll have some question answers. Um, if you can just, if you have a question, I'll, I'll bring the mic uh, just so it can be recorded um, for the video. I could offer answers to the questions and then you guys can try and guess the question. <laughs> Hi. First off, thank you very much for your talk. I, I really enjoyed uh, hearing what you had to say today. Um, to one of the, the first poems that, uh, that you just kind of read to us uh, in the section of the streets, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the uh, kind of the language that you use seems to, uh, to come from like the Brumaire, the 18th Brumaire, mm -hmm. and your references to like Louis Napoleon. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the aspects that took me was like you used the term ghost. Which, which Marx uses at the very beginning uh, of, of the Brumaire, mm -hmm. which says what we, what we precisely don't need uh, are these ghosts of revolutions past. We need something new. I'm wondering in terms of the type of poetry that you're talking about, kind of this, this poesis of, of kind of creating this, this antagonist subjectivity, mm -hmm. how much of our language is something that's kind of rooted in the past, something that's in, in history, as opposed to something that's rooted in today, in the everyday. And that if that language is something that is of the past, is it something that we can really forge ahead with today? Or do we need something new? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. No. <laughs> I should. Um, you know, I, yeah, you're right. I, I was, and I, I've, I've thought a lot about that, that opening of the, of the Brumaire especially. Um, because I don't agree with what Marx is saying there. And, and I think it's, it's a very localizable why he's saying that, when he's saying that, because, you know, okay, 1830, they looked back to 1789. Here we go, 1848, we're still looking back. Um, and Marx sees that as part of the failing. Uh, for me, a really instructive response to that is in Walter Benjamin's um, Theses on the Philosophy of History, which doesn't identify directly, but I, I, I can't help but reading it as a response to Marx, because, of course, Benjamin does say the opposite. He says, we're stuck looking back. We're, 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 that's the angel of history. We can't help it. Uh, but in this tiger's leap, as, as Benjamin calls it, we, we can find those moments that we can still build from because there's this massive heap of wreckage. And culture just, you know, we, we see it by walking into a library. We see it by walking into an art gallery. Uh, we see it by walking into any department store uh, at, a, at a, um, a consumptive level, at a cultural level, at an intellectual level. We heap up and accumulate masses amounts of stuff. Uh, we don't use all that. We waste most of it. Uh, and yet nothing's, we're not getting anywhere. So I, I think Benjamin opens a door just to go back to that idea and go, no, nah, we need the ghosts. I mean, we just got to talk to the right ones. <laughs> As it were. Um, or go back to the ones that no one actually ever listened to and go, oh, we should have listened to that guy. Uh, so I, I think... Um, and again, I, I think you could draw a nice line conceptually from Benjamin to the, a lot of the stuff that Zapatistas say. Uh, and that is, yeah, th th I think there's a focus on the present, but the present, in the present, we're absolutely accompanied by uh, beholden to ghosts, dependent upon things the ghosts have to offer us. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that that's where I'd go with that. Uh, I, I agree we need to look at present, current, 
conditions and figure out what to do within those conditions. But part of the figuring out what to do and the response to the present uh, has our, our, our eyes going to the past and the future at the same time. It's sort of part of what I'm, I guess I'm trying to talk about there. I hope that's a, a response. Well, I have a, it's probably not a question, more a comment. Um, mm -hmm. When you're talking about the, the future as a space for contestation mm -hmm. um, and making the kind of the references, the back and forth with the past and the future, um, I've been working with uh, the concept of the future interior for, for a while, which right. is um, the, the, the future, and, and for me maybe it makes a bit more sense in French, but, uh, but it, it exists in English as well, I, yeah. I think. <laughs> Uh, and so it's a, the projection of the past, but in the future. So it's a, it's in the future, but it, it's a future that will have, that will have been. So it's a future that is past. Um, and I, yeah. I started thinking, be, being really interested in it as almost this idea of the anti potential, because it's um, it's something that you, you like you block off potential right away because you're saying that something that's already going to have happened and you're predicting it for the future as a future that will ha have, you know, it's, it's done, I'm saying it, I'm gonna do it. Uh, so I was working on it with that and in almost kind of what you were saying about the, um, the, the banks that have already banked up all of this carbon, right? Like it's done, it's, yeah. we're counting on it. But now I'm, I'm switched my thinking a little bit, almost thinking about it as this like, no, actually I can, I can turn around and say, yes, I will have done something that will have been a resistance to that or and I will have you know changed or done whatever right so as this yeah. kind of like t turning it into something very positive um, yeah. and that's what I'm working with right now and in, in my in my thinking with that concept um, you just want to share that yes it's wonderful and I think I think you're you're right that second version of it is how I, I would think of it so once we go through that exercise of, of positing in the future we will have done X we will have arrived at this situation. By having that to look at, then we can negotiate around that. Like we would deal with any present conditions and, and limits. We go, oh, okay, um, we've got to deal with this now. I think it's probably really important for our present thinking to have that future state of existence as something we're negotiating right now, because I don't think anyone is, um, not in a serious way. We're not taking it as a space that we can locate and, and then contest. We're just, ah, you know. Let's see what the, what the market's like next quarter. Come back to me then. Um, I was fascinated recently by discovering that um, um, Shell Oil is the, the only major oil company that acknowledges climate change. It says, yep, that's real. <laughs> that's happening. And they have for quite a while now. And in fact, since like the 1970s, Shell has employed futurists. We refer to them as Shell's futurists, um, who every few years produce a document saying what the world's going to be like in, so for instance, in 2005, they reported on the year 2025. In 2009 or 10, they reported on the year 2050. And apparently, they're now working on the year 2100. And in this projection of what the future will look like, they, they take the idea of climate change and its effects seriously. And then they make uh, business plan A and business plan B around that reality. So they, they name them, one is called Blueprint and one is called Scramble. And Blueprint is generally sort of going, okay, well, uh, if, if society is pushing back and telling us less fossil fuels, and if the other companies are, are, if everyone's reacting to that social pressure, here's a kind of more diversified business model where we'll do a little bit less, uh, we'll balance oil, coal, gas, do a little bit less of each, put some money in, in, in renewable fuels, yada, yada, yada. Scramble, the, other, the plan B is, well, if, if no one's really, if so the social pushback isn't that strong, if other companies aren't reacting in any way, fuck it, the scramble's on and we got to get everything we can. Regardless of what, you know, we'll all be dead by 2100. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's like Monopoly, the game ends, you put it away eventually, I guess, I don't know. Um, I'm fascinated by that. So, you know, if Shell Oil is fucking well willing to, you know, uh, project the future and then work around that as an actual obstacle it has to deal with. Well, we bloody well better be too. Is <laughs> a hand back there. Thanks. Uh, building on some of the comments on uh, the future, 
Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of the future interior as sort of a deterministic uh, vision of the future. And I find that nowadays, um, less than ever, we're, we're deterministic about the future. What will happen in the future, we don't know, as opposed to taking that sense of ownership, that this will happen because we will make it happen. And I wonder if you can comment on that in, in terms of the idea of resistance. Yeah, well, I think that, that the deterministic side of that is, is a real problem because I think that's where we largely are. Um, and, you know, there's more and more reports coming out that suggest that uh, the real economic powers in the world have clearly decided, you know, well, it's, it is going to shit. Uh, but let's, you know, figure out. One thing I've been thinking about recently, again, too, and in these kind of exact circumstances. Um, well, well, here's an idea. I think maybe what we're, now that climate change is really sort of the lid is coming down in terms of people's awareness and kind of feeling of terror around that idea, uh, we're, we're right back where I was as a child in the area, era of, of the bomb and the threat of the bomb, that, that, that complete annihilation of the species could happen any time now. And when I was a kid, just growing up in Victoria, because there was a naval base there, I guess, it was assumed to be a target. It's the third largest um, dry dock or something like that on the west coast of North America and South America, that uh, Victoria would be a, an atomic target. Therefore, they used to test every week an air raid siren in Victoria, sort of suggesting, you know, get under your desk now, the bomb's falling. I started thinking about that film, uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, which is great because you get this scene of all the, 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 the American high mucky mucks in their war room starting to talk about, uh, create a scenario for the future. Well, okay, we all blow up and die. What do we do? It's, it's so much like shell oil in a way, <laughs> in a pretty eerie, strange way. So, you know, in the movie, they, they talk about, we'll go down to these mines, you know, and it's, it's, it's sort of absolutely parodic about that male, you know, masculine world leader, you know, we'll need many women each because we have to repopulate the earth and all this kind of discussions that go into working out their scenario for, for the future. Um, so th there's always this tension, I think, between that deterministic sense of this is real and, oh shit, we're fucked, uh, and our, our, our uh, hopeless, ridiculous ability as human beings to go, to either ignore that <laughs> or, or, or to, to look at it and go, well, it's got to be a it's got to be a workaround. Let's try and figure it out. Um, I don't think most states and governments are, are are seriously working on a workaround. I think they're mostly just doing what they do, which is some talk, 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 and then don't do much at all. Um, the thing that uh, art, literature, you know, our cultural practices and productions can provide us is is modeling. And often, what's simply being modeled, I was trying to suggest in part, is a, is a kind of subjectivity. Um, but that also can be uh, a kind of agency that we feel we lack because of deterministic um, um, thoughts and, and, and traps we're in. When, when artworks reveal to us uh, uh, agents who, who are in situations where they, they, they up and do stuff, um, th those can, I think those are the kind of things where well, well, we need more of that right now, maybe. We need more of that, that, that voice that says, you know what, I'm going to talk back. <laughs> Even though there seems to be no hope or uh, we're stuck here, but I'm, I'm going to hell, I'm going to do it. No, I don't know if that was a very good answer, but I'm good at looping around questions. Hey, Steve, I hand? have a question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing, Andrea? Um, you might have partially answered it in what you just said, the kind of subjectivity you're interested in um, making... Uh, a capacity for or embodying is the kind that is going to talk back. Um, but my question is about the form of your presentation, and um, I think it's thereby also a question about the hypothesis or your argument. Um, so, I mean, it was basically dialectical, right? We had poetry, uh, and then we had, if not direct action, direct s speaking uh, statement. Um, and I guess I, I found myself wondering, um, or just trying to really pay attention to what my feelings were when you were reading the poetry, and, and maybe I guess I was wondering what was, what your hope is, or what your, um, uh, you know, what your wager is for like what happens in people when the poetry happens, um, and then you know, uh, it's obviously no, you can't you know, know ahead of time what's going to happen, and that's part of what's good about it, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, if you could just speak a little bit more to, I mean, I know the goal of that dialectic is a kind of commoning. Yeah. Um, that's the effect. That's the desired effect. But what's 
the feeling that's supposed to, that we're supposed to be getting. Nice. I like that question. Um, yeah, there's a couple of tensions that I was sort of working with and thinking about and aware of. Um, and, and I guess I, I, don't, I don't think very, in a very Hegelian way about the dialectic, although I, 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 I guess I'm more... Um, I follow some things that Frederick Jameson said in, in recent works where he goes back to the notion of, of, a, of a, a tension that's unresolvable. Um, and so there's some unresolvable tensions here. Let's just put it that way, maybe. Maybe the dialectic's not the right, right word for that. But um, So one is between this idea of resistance means bodies, streets, conflict, or resistance means, well, we need a capacity that is built not only through bodies, streets, conflict, although it is in part by knowing that, hey, that happens here, doesn't it? Uh, see, and again, the, the, the Quebec student movement is an off, incredible example of this. Well, how did they get hundreds of thousands of people on the streets? How did they uh, get 300,000 of 400,000 students to strike? Um, it didn't come out of the blue. It came because there have been nine strikes since 1968. Uh, it, 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 it was there because there was already a capacity to resist as students on a campus against things like tuition hikes uh, because there was this track record. And then there were actually our structures, more or less, in the universities um, that students could turn to when you sort of arrive at school and, well, this is part of the culture, that's what you do. So capacity building occurs uh, through the example of past resistance and struggle, but it also, uh, and often part of that past struggle, uh, the remediation of it for us now is through songs and uh, narratives and poems and artworks and photographs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these things already have this intensely uh, imbricated relationship, I think. Uh, then within the poetry side of this, I want to also highlight, well, there's also two ways, I think, that, that poems, and again, every time I'm saying poem, to me it's kind of a shorthand. We could talk about all sorts of other media and, and, and uh, genres. But anyhow, sticking with the poem example, you know, you've got that, that poem that, that's an immediate reaction like I think this kind of situation is, and that it's about agency in a lot of ways, right? It's like, look at this bloody guy. <laughs> it's like it's this giant truck with a cannon shooting at him, and he's just, and you know, the, the video of these things are amazing. There's a video of a lot of these. You know, he's not the only one who was doing this. Lots of people were doing this. And you know, the, the, it goes on for like five or ten minutes of, of the guy just holding again, uh, his position against this water cannon. Uh, so there's that, 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 moment that, 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 you, that is seized on and, and rendered as a kind of, of uh, a scream, an ang angry, a call, a challenge, a resistance, an agency, those sorts of things are engaged. Then there's those other ones, like especially the, 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 the Walking Through the Streets poem I read, um, Dear Common Vancouver, and uh, the Blackberries one. Now, what, what I think, so you've got this looser, non-narrative space in which these elements are sort of moving and hovering through. So, and I'm, I, I do, I, th I think about what, what is going through the, the reader's mind, how is the reader experiencing feeling? It's actually feeling. not so much, sorry to interrupt, but no, no. I just wanted to clarify, it's not, it, like, it's actually a simple, like, like sort of question a therapist would ask you, like, what are you, feel, like, what's your emotion that you have? right now, right? Like, so I'm just wondering, like, is the best one for you and in this work anger right now? Like a particular kind of anger? Or is that, does it have to be metered with kinds of like intimations of a certain kind of joy of collectivity? Or yeah, yeah. it's just like really the emotion I'm in. Okay. I, I want to hear you. Well, well the, the first and last poem, I think there, there, there is anger there as an element for sure. Uh, I don't personally feel it or see it in the other two. So, you know, I, I don't, is, is, is thinking an emotion? Because what I'm hoping is people are thinking through these, these elements that are being named and offered and different versions of what it might mean to common, how we might identify space and think of it in terms of what is the use of the space, who owns the space, what is ownership as a concept. So I, I want these, this, is this variety and matrix of ideas to be um, worked through. So I guess at that point it's less... It's less a feeling, I, I suppose. It's certainly not a, I'm not looking for or imagining people are feeling angry necessarily. Um, and I don't know what other emotion or feeling I, or affect I would necessarily um, name for it, what goes on in those poems. Uh, but what, what they were as projects of writing were, were a thinking through and intentionally thinking through something in a way that wasn't uh, narrowing or closing or, or defining, wasn't narrative, wasn't 
um, structured that way, but what if I can identify a territory and then wander in that territory as, as widely as I, as I can while I'm writing this poem? And so I'm hoping that that's what readers would do too, is, is wander through the, the, the intellectual territory that's sort of being um, haphazardly mapped out. But I, I'd be curious, I and mean, maybe Andrew, you can tell me after what you were feeling, or because now, now you've got me wondering about that. <laughs> you know, that I think are great models, um, have a kind of enthusiasm that's emotional, mm -hmm. right? And it has to do with different forms of religiosity, whether it's ind indigenous or, or else, mm -hmm. elsewise, <laughs> elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so poetry, I mean, in sort of like secular terms, is maybe fulfills a similar role. I mean, that's been argued a million times, but sure. anyway, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. We yeah, and I, I guess I'm, well, the more I consider what you're saying, I think, I think thinking in these kind of contexts is very emotional. It is powerful, you, and it does. It can lead in the direction of anger. It can lead in the direction of of of, um, of a kind of urgency to act and and and, and do something, and, and to that kind of that that strange, hard to pin down uh, um, uh, feeling of having thought deeply, widely, and 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 uh, um, you know pleasurably about something. Uh, hi, Steve. Hi, Megan. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, expand a little bit more about um, the relationship between creation and resistance, um, and at kind of at what point does resistance become creation, or do you see them as kind of separate entities in themselves? Yeah, good. Um, Kegel, who I'm sort of, you know, I was excited to read that book, and so I'm pulling his argument apart as I, and dragging it along with me here, uh, he, he suggested that there's that important doubleness to resistance, that, they're, that, that they're f how we, what we commonly identify as resistance or experience as resistance uh, is typically reactive and, and negative in a sense. And he says primarily um, resistance isn't about um, freedom, let's say, which a lot of our utopian uh, um, um, left progressive thought uh, gravitates toward uh, a sort of positive sense of freedom. That's, that's a positive value, which would be great if we were free. And, and how often is, is political language um, and, and been used, uh, misused and abused, that term, of course, as well. Um, but he, he starts off by saying that primarily, you know, contra that, resistance is negative. It's about saying, no, we don't want that, and we're going to stand here until you stop doing that. Uh, and he, he sees that as an important move to, to, to sort of separate that and not get confused uh, with uh, ideas of, of, of freedom. Um, at the same time, he also says, don't lose sight of the fact that there is a, a, a positive side to resistance, that resistance engages a lot of creative thinking for this is what we need to build in order to resist. So when, when, when he's talking about capacity in that book on resistance, I kept thinking about the way that term and concept is used in social movements. And, and in my experience, we're, we're constantly, as organizers, talking about building the capacity of our movement. And so that's a kind of resistance. You know, we're resisting, let's say, a pipeline. But in the process of, of building this resistance, of building our capacity, there's a whole host of, of, of very positive, creative, productive things that go on. And so uh, Rising Tide, one of the groups I work with, is planning, uh, you should all know, April 4th to 6th, a weekend of training, of, of seminars, and, and you, you can learn to do all sorts of practical things, but a lot of uh, panels and discussions and intellectual stuff too. But the whole notion of organizing something like that, and of course there have been dozens of the years of climate camps that different groups, Greenpeace, whoever, have put on. The whole idea is discussed in terms of capacity building. We need to build people's capacity so they will show up at a demonstration, they will know what to do, they might go beyond that and chain themselves to things and figure out how to do that and work as a group and how to rely on each other and how to be aware of, of, of things like, you know, here's a seminar on transphobia, here's a seminar on all sorts of things that connect with our capacity to work together collectively and, and resist. So they're, they're, they're really inseparable, the, the, those, those negative take away, I want you to stop doing that kind of resistance, and how do we actually get that negative resistance to work 
wow, we've got to do all this positive capacity building in order to make that effective. Yeah, I, I was quite struck by the um, concluding line of the first poem that you read, which basically said you may be reading this poem someday when you're uh, in front of a bank uh, <laughs> uh, resisting. Yeah. Um, and I have two questions about that line. The first is, um, it, does that reflect your fundamental optimism and the inspirational quality uh, of the poem? Or, I mean, how far into uh, Marianne's uh, future interior are we projecting? Or, or is it really a pessimistic view um, that the same, uh, the, the, uh, that suggests the futility um, of resistance deep, deep into the future? That's my first question about that line. The second question I have about that line is, um, you know, we often say in, uh, in argument that when you allow your opponent to dictate the terms of the debate, you've essentially already lost the argument from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Now, when we translate that argument into the geographic context, context into uh, spaces of contestation, uh, can we also say that when the, um, when the space of contestation is, in effect, dictated by the superstructure that the resistance has already lost the debate? In other words, if we are, uh, if, if, if the space of resistance is in front of the chromed uh, doorway uh, of a bank, uh, in some sense, uh, has the resistance been lost? And so do we have to rethink the spaces of contestation uh, from a strategic point of view? That's great. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think to the first point, yeah, I think the li last lines of that poem are both optimistic and pessimistic. There's that ambiguity and tug and pull in them. Um, I think largely they're pessimistic on the side of poetry. So you know, poetry is not the same as hucking a rock, storming a bank apartment. Uh, but the optimistic side is, but you might be reading that poem with people you actually are about to storm a bank or apartment with. Um, so the, you know, it's a bit cheeky and playful at that level, but I think you're, you're right, it's, it's, there's a bit of, of a tug and push and pull, um, although it does sort of fall into these two lines I'm looking at, like, okay, here's a space that we're contesting, here's the sort of cultural, artistic uh, capacity building things we get involved in. Uh, when push comes to shove, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to push and shove and not sit down and write a poem. <laughs> uh, I probably, a uh, big fault uh, is that I'm pretty optimistic. And I don't, that's just ingrained, but <laughs> it can sometimes be a problem that I look at and go, eh, maybe. You know. So then let's talk about the dead. <laughs> um, this, uh, the second part of your, of your comment, that, that's, that's a lot trickier. Um, and I, th I think it, to, to take that as a critique, let's say, and I think it, it's essentially a critique you're offering, I, I think I agree with that critique. Um, that, that is, uh, if we accept their terms, we've lost. And far too often, um, uh, activists' actions that are put on are on the grounds and in the terms of what, what the state is currently allowing um, the, the terms. So if we simply go, well, we've got to stop this pipeline, and, and people get too you know, <laughs> caught up on this one goddamn pipeline, I think there's a big, there could be a big problem with that. Um, because I think it's in part accepting their terms. You know, we want to ram this pipeline through your backyard. Well, we don't want you to do that. But we're not talking about what we might actually want. We're not talking about a whole host of other things. One thing I love about Rising Tide is in the last year here in Vancouver, they've sort of gone after every <laughs> angle of this. They've, gone, they've done an oil-focused um, uh, demonstration, this, this, this march around the Enbridge hearings. Uh, they've done uh, a, a coal port expansion action. They've done a fracking action where they put the, the, the well up in Chrissy Clark's yard. Um, they're, they're coming at every angle. Now, that, that can be 
capacity draining when you do all of that. But I think there's, there's an awareness there and serious discussions around exactly this problem. That, that, that if, we, if we focus too narrow, if we do the expected, if we, if we pick a campaign, and this is, partially it's the NGO problem. NGOs will fall into this because they, they have to identify themselves in some way to, to get funding. And so they go, well, we are about this issue and we will put all our energy and resources into that issue. And sometimes the, the wider picture or the complexity of the actual picture can get lost. Um, so I think that's a, that's a real danger, a real problem we see all the time. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be an optimistic person, pick one part of what you said and say, so that, yeah, I think we need to go through um, processes, processes of redefining the spaces of contestation to try and find our own terms that it's a constant negotiation to, to identify, name, describe, and figure out how we will negotiate these spaces. Other questions? Hi again. Um, I'm just wondering why you, you chose the term uh, kind of research laboratories for this space that you're talking about. Um, to me, it kind of like evokes um, kind of when we're talking about capital and resistance, language and poetry, kind of we can't ignore that we're existing within some sort of space of like a cognitive capitalism. And like a research laboratory is a place where, you know, the communicative and the productive act kind of coincide. Um, and in that space, I mean, there are people who have written about, well, you know, does the effective potency of, of poetry just disappear in that type of realm? So I'm wondering if you can build on, on why you chose that term. Yes. Um, there's a simple answer, which is for the bad pun, I guess, where, because I, you know, I'm, I, I started with the riot dog term that, that people I know involved in commune editions in Oakland uh, had posited as in part a critique of poetry. Like, no, don't get too excited. Let's actually go throw some bricks. Don't just write some poems and think you're being political. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, that's true, but then there's this whole other side of, of what poetry or any cultural... Uh, practice can actually provide in ways it can engage the world um, that yeah they're not the same as throwing a brick uh, but they do all sorts of other things that we also need to have have happening so you know, I think it was a quick leap from there to some ways I have thought about and, and approached poetry uh, my colleague Jeff Dirksen um, who spoke in this series with ur urban subjects um, has, has written to some extent about this idea of, of, of um, non-normative kinds of research that you have in many art, art practices, you know, especially with, with the whole tradition of site-specific artworks where the apparatus of doing research, is, especially the apparatus of field work um, and ethnography is very much a big part of what goes on. Um, so I, you know, I, I had that thought and I think you know, the, the, the Blackberry poem in some ways is a kind of site-specific investigation of a very specific space. Um, I was fascinated by, you know, right in the middle of the city and you know, there's this huge bramble that people are feeding off of. <laughs> um, so there's a kind of, of research that I, that, I, that I like to think of as going on in that kind of a poem. Research at the level of having a site, finding out, and thinking through what you're finding out in that site. I think lab is the wrong, is where the real problem starts to occur. <laughs> and it only happens because, oh, dogs, labs is a dog. Well, that'll be funny. Hardly. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's very true. Although, I don't know, somewhere rattling around the back of my brain too, I think, is um, uh, a real feeling for uh, scientists right now. And uh, I know a lot of scientists who want to go throw bricks. And that, that's, that's ama an amazing thing that's, that's happening right now. And that, that's, that's, there's a sign of hope. <laughs> scientists want to huck something. Um, so maybe I've got a little bit of a, of a different feeling for the, for the laboratory than I used to have. I don't know. But I think it's, it's, it's a bad joke, and, and, and I wouldn't want to steer people wrong about containing them in that laboratory. <laughs> thanks, and thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I just wanted to uh, maybe add something to the question that was asked, because I think it's a super important question. But also, I think it can be asked the other way. And I was thinking specifically of the Turbulence Collective, who in 2008 asked, what if we won? And that was their way of thinking through uh, the 
financial meltdown of 2008 right. if it hadn't resulted in something like Occupy, but had rather resulted in something that was seen as an anti-capitalist movement actually winning that moment. And it was just, uh, I'm not sure I actually agree with them, but I think yeah. it was like a very interesting thought process for how activism, particularly on the left, tends to always take a pessimistic view. And so they asked, what if we take the optimistic view instead? Yeah. So that's, that, that's one point. I just wanted to talk because this is up here. I went to the uh, Museum of Vancouver last week to see the Wilding exhibition uh -huh. and found out much to my surprise that blackberries are actually an invasive species, which I didn't know. Yeah. So actually when you create a commons, you're creating it through consuming a colonizer, which is <laughs> like super interesting. It so is. So those are my two comments, thanks. Yeah, well to think of that, that second one first, um, you know, I was really fascinated by that. So yeah, I did a lot of research and, and uh, a friend of mine, another poet, Lisa Robertson, had done a bit of writing about blackberries too. So I think it was really with her that I learned the story of Luther Burbank, this horticulturalist, Burbank, California is named after him, who decided there were all these kinds of plants that, from Europe that he wanted to have. So this blackberry uh, comes from the, the Caucasus Mountains and the Caucasus in Eastern Europe or the edge of Asia, wherever we are there. Um, uh, that's where that originates from. There is a native blackberry species uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's not a big arcing cane grower. It's a, it's a run, ground runner, but it does, they look just like these blackberries, but they're much smaller. They taste similar, but even sharper and better, I think. Um, but these big beasts that grow like crazy came in 1886, I think, to California and were planted there. So from 1886, they've made it from California to northern BC now. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing, that, that mobility of a, of a species. And I thought of exactly that last thing you mentioned. Uh, in, in the terms of, um, so this is an, this invasive thing. And then, is the commons an invasive idea? That is, can you actually look at uh, an indigenous sense of, of land and refer to it as a commons? So take that European idea and go, oh, it's just, it's just like a commons. That's what they're commoning. That's what they're doing. Does that actually work? I don't know that it does. It comes close, but I think it creates some other problems um, too. You know, the, the shared thing that I like between those two notions is the complete absence of, of an idea that you can own. You know, that, that's why I love about the common as it, as it exists, say, in a European trajectory. It, it breaks that, that binary of private and public. And, and the reality that we have now, which is there's no such thing as public. What gets called public is still private. Someone owns that. It's a state that owns it. And they act just like any other proprietor. No, you can't do that. Leave the park by 11 p.m. Don't take your dog off a leash here, or whatever they do. But they, they completely police and manage those spaces like, like any proprietor would. So we don't really have an alternative to private. We just have a different kind of private public. So that, I love the, how common comes in and sort of breaks it up and says, no, there's no ownership. It's, it's purely about preserving its unown unownedness. Um, in a little bit in this Blackberry poem, it come, uh, there's some stray references to the whole tradition in England of the enclosure of commons to fence destroying. So commoners would, when someone enclosed and privatized a formerly common space, they would go in at night with hatchets and, and tools and tear the fences apart and destroy them. And that there became this, it was a kind of resistance, but it became a kind of uh, this sort of celebratory destruction of we're going to go and, and chopping down hedges and things like that too. To, to open and reclaim spaces. Anyhow, I'm far afield here, aren't I? Yes, so the, the, so I, I think there is a bit of a disconnect, and, and here is this invasive colonizing species that nevertheless becomes a ground for commoning. Is there hope in that flip or reversibility? I don't know, but I'm curious about that. Um, but the positive, too, uh, that you brought us back to. You know, I, one thing that hovered in, in the back of my mind in this talk um, that comes close to something Kegel says, it comes close to things that Benjamin again says in, in the Theses on History, which essentially is a version of this, again, a kind of a slogan that became active in Occupy, which is, we're the ones we've been waiting for, if anyone remembers that particular slogan, which is unbelievably hopeful, and it's also positioning us as the future of the past, <laughs> uh, saying we, we're here, this is what we, everyone expected, it's for us to arrive and make everything better now. So there's something incredibly hopeful for that uh, in that. It's interesting that 
so much of what got attacked around Occupy was in the kind of idealistic, oh, sure, you know, yeah, buddies, it's all great for you white guys to say, yeah, yeah, we feel good and positive. Um, you know, and there was obviously legitimate critiques to be launched there too, but it is kind of interesting that it was often the, the language of, of positivity and hope that was, you know, nailed to the wall. I was told we have time for one more question, so if there's Great. a final question. Um, thanks for your talk, Stephen. I really wish that there was more I could, I could disagree with you <laughs> about but, and have a more interesting question. Um, we can work on it. Quickly, I, I, would, I would say uh, specifically to the blackberries and this idea of the colonizing plant, I've actually been in an ongoing conversation with uh, this artist, Gina Badger, who's really interested in mugwort as a, oh, as a metaphor for colonization and the spread from the East Coast to the West. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we've been talking about is as a metaphor for unsettling. So looking at this idea of what happens after the moment of colonization, the moment of contact, um, mm -hmm. where you can't change that as a fact, mm -hmm. but what happens in terms of other modes of being in that space. And I think yeah. blackberries operate wonderfully as a model for, or potentially, I should say, operate as a model for unsettling one. Yeah. Um, and then I guess my real question for you is just, uh, you know, we, we all, many of us, I'm sure in this room, are familiar with the, the tension between um, you know, the Ignats, the throwing the brick versus um, the writing the poem, you know, that art is not the same thing as action, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that that's a really potent thing among organizers and potent thing among academics and among artists in particular, uh, an, an issue that people on the left wrestle with and anyone who's been touched by Marx can't quite sleep at night because <laughs> of it. But my question is, you've been involved in community organizing. When it comes to grassroots people and people involved in grassroots politics, the, the people, that movement that is being organized, do you find a lot of um, criticism? You know, have, have you tried reading a poem to a bunch of people who are about to storm a parliament? And what's <laughs> been the reaction? Um, I have, although you know, we, we, weren't, we were storming in the, the good old tried truth sense of we were gonna take to the streets. We stormed a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, I have. Um, so yeah, there's just two sides that I'm really fascinated by. I agree with you. It's sort of obvious and duh, we've had this debate, and yet in the Occupy moment and in the post-2008 crash moment, there's been a lot of arguments in poetry communities especially around it's not enough to just write an easy political poem. That's, forget that. And you know, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by the fact that, that Occupy produced about a half dozen websites of Occupy poetry. Some are extensive, like eight or uh, the one is a PDF of over 800 pages of mostly amateur, quote, poetry about finance and excesses of the banks and the political situation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why it would produce that? Why, why this political context would call into being scads and scads and scads of, of you know, what a lot of us might think of as sort of bad or average political poetry. Um, and then you get people within sort of avant-garde traditions sort of jumping up and going, oh, that's, this is horrible. It's not good art. And you get a people jumping up and going, well, yeah, but art is not enough. We've got to go throw a brick. And so those old debates come racing back in in, in a kind of crazy and mind-boggling way. Um, and then the other thing, re real revealing thing when you look at that debate is, yeah, people that don't necessarily have a day-to-day -day relationship to poetry uh, and are organizing and are planning an event, and they, they, they think on the list of what we'd like to have, a, a poetry reading would be a good thing. You know, someone might sing a song. There might be clowns. There might be, we want a politician, we want a this person, we want that person. You can start uh, putting the pieces together of, of a rally or an event of some kind. That, that, that still comes to mind. That's still front and center. People think, oh, we should have a poem read. So yeah, I've been asked to read, and sometimes you know, the most uh, strange occasion for me was a rally around one of the Harper's bills in the last couple years, that Bill 35, whatever that was, one of the omnibus bills. Um, so I was asked specifically, would you not only come read a poem at this rally, would you write a poem about the bill? <laughs> and, you know, and I was okay with that. Because <laughs> I realized you know, the, the context is, is everything. And, and the fact that Poetry is being called upon to, to give voice to something in, a, in, a, in its own particular terms of some kind. Um, you know, I'd go back to Andrea's thought too, what, what, and you start thinking right away about what do I want people to feel? What is, what is, what is called for in this context of a poem for a, for a rally? 
um, it's, it's fascinating to me. And that, and that, you know, you're reading it into a bullhorn and people are loving it. And that's, it's a, it, it gets me back to that idea of, of capacity building. That, yeah, this is part of the picture of, of what makes this work. We're always on that knife edge of, boy, this is pretty predictable, you know. <laughs> Uh, let's get that folk song up here right now. Um, and at the same time, it, it has these, these capacity-building, affective uplift. That's the whole point of now we're going to go out and do something. I don't know if I'm answering your question really at all, but, but it, uh, you know, I, I think, I think it, that's an, an important thing to, to embrace and lay aside some of these more complicated debates about um, uh, the relationship between being concept and, and, and material and action and these sorts of things and, and embrace the fact that there is a culture around protest that is part of how it builds its capacity and get in there. Make some salmon masks. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for participating. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to the talk. And I would invite you to attend our next and final talk of the series by Kirsty Robertson on April 16, 7 p.m. in this room. And uh, look at the UNIPIT website for more information on the rest of the events for the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mary.